The Virgin Mary is given a lot of different names within the church. Um, the Theotokos, which basically loosely translates as God-bearer in, in, in some ways. Um, but we kind of keep it in the Greek to keep a, a stronger, deeper you know, name for her. And then uh, some, some call her the Panagia, which is like the most holy one, you know. So within the church, she is very revered because she is the first Christian. She's the one whom God chose um, to take flesh from in order to save us, um, to be crucified with that flesh, and then to give us that flesh in Holy Communion. Um, that flesh was taken from her because she was a pure person. And um, ancient Christians always venerated her. She was looked at as the the most pure and blameless offering that humanity could give back to God, right? And that almost all of human history in a lot of ways was um, before, before the incarnation of Christ was to give birth to the Virgin Mary so that we'd have this blameless offering that God could take flesh from and become incarnate and save his people. And so this is why she's so revered is because she's the holiest person that had lived and that was able, we were able to offer to God in order that our Lord and God and Savior would become incarnate and, and save us from our bondage into sin and, and death. And so it's a little bit different. Our veneration is, is a bit different than in Roman Catholicism. Um, we don't have things like um, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, or um, we don't celebrate exactly the same um, assumption of, of, of the Virgin Mary. And there's a few other aspects like that are different. There's a great book that St. John Maximovich wrote on the Orthodox veneration of the Mother of God that lays those things out uh, really clearly and beautifully. Um, so there are distinctions between uh, Roman Catholicism and orthodoxy as far as the, the veneration of the Mother of God and, uh, and the theology around that surrounds that. Um, but it's different from Protestantism because we do revere her um, more than, than what the West proclaims her to be, you know. That, and that's from high church Protestantism where she's still revered for, for her virtue in some ways. And then in some low evangelical things, you know, she's looked at as kind of just like this vessel that God used, uh, which is a terrible thing. But um, we, the reason why we love her is because she's the first Christian. She's the one who dedicated herself to Christ first. And so she paves a way for all of us. And she exemplifies all of the virtues of Christ. And she's the one who stood by him on the cross. And she becomes in that way, we become part of Christ's body. She becomes in a mystical sense, our mother, because Christ's body is taken from her flesh, right? And so in this way, the church calls her our mother as well. And not that she takes any um, precedence or veneration away from Christ, because as we see in the icons of her, she is primarily always with Christ, um, holding him as a child, showing forth the incarnation for the most part. And she is usually gesturing to him, right? To, to gesture the people away from herself and to Christ. And so whenever we're looking upon her and gazing upon her, we're, we're, we're being directed to him. And all of the virtues that enshroud her are the things that uh, shine forth the witness of Christ in the world. And it also shows us that human beings can can be clothed in this um, in this grace and this virtue um, that Christ wants to give all of his people you know Saint Simeon the new theologian says that we are like we are to become like Theotoki that is like a little little Theotokos a little Virgin Mary you know? and he says because we're supposed to especially when we receive Holy Communion but even with the grace of God that he comes to dwell within us right, with, with inside of us, just like he dealt within the Virgin Mary um, and became incarnate and was birthed into the world through her. In a mystical sense, um, we hold Christ within us. We're supposed to be these God-bearers. We're supposed to be these little Virgin Marys that 
hold Christ so dearly within us and then give birth to him in the world. That is to spread this grace of God, right? And not just to keep it inside, but to make it witness, to make it manifested into the world. And so she shows us how to do that, right? She is one who received him, who received this beautiful treasure with, within her life and then gave birth to him. Um, and um, through, partaking of, through taking of her flesh, the Lord went out and saved his people. And so it is the same thing in our life. Uh, we are to hold Christ within us and then make him manifest um, to the world. So she is an example, uh, the primary example of how a human being who dedicates their self to Christ, um, it makes God manifest to the world. In English, we're so like um, deficient in the way we speak, right? So when we look at the word love, for instance, there's all different forms of love. And C.S. Lewis has a book on, on all these different forms of love. Um, and, and, but we use love all of the time. We just throw it around all of the time, right? Um, I, can, I love my father, I love my wife, I love my son, but I all love them in different ways, right? And I love food too, but they're all in different ways. None of them are the same. Um, and it's the same thing with, um, with various words in English and even the word worship, for instance. Um, and the Greek has different uh, connotations to it. Um, and we, we, the, those that we use the word uh, often for different things, but it can, it, it can uh, like define something more than something else and not be the same. And same thing was this praying, right? Um, we entreat, like the old English, we, I pray you to do this, right? We're entreating somebody to do something. And, but at the same time, many times when somebody hears the word pray, they can, they can confuse it with just a direct worship of something, right? Or someone. And so um, that's the distinction is that when, we're, when, we're, when we use this word pray, we're not using it the same context for one thing as for another thing. Just like I love my wife differently than I love my father or I love food or some other kind of hobby that I have, right? And praying, to the saints is not worshiping the saints. It's, in, it's entreating the saints to, to do something for us, to help us, right? And praying to God is a worship that is only given to him. And so there's different contexts in which we use the word um, and the definition of them, um, or the, uh, it, it, can be, it can be different, right? Um, so, when we're praying to saints, we're entreating them, we're praying to God, we are worshiping him in a way that he is only due, that we do not give to the saints. There's a hymn in which we say, Theotokos, save us. Yes. And you know, people on the outside listening to that, they're like almost scandalized. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, most holy Theotokos, save us. It's very, very common to hear within the church, uh, calling out to the mother of God to save us. but. You know, there's a difference between knowing salvation in Christ and then asking a doctor to save you because you're in dire distress or dire sickness, right? Or if you fall overboard on a, on a vessel and you're calling out to the people on board, save me, help me, right? Um, it's a different context than knowing that Christ is your savior, you know? And so, yeah, it's the same exact thing. We're, we're using the same word but in a different way, right? So when we call out Most Holy Theotokos, save us, it's not at all like we are talking about Christ as our savior, you know? Um, it's a totally different thing. Imagine more that you're this person who has fallen off, into, off of a vessel into the water and are drowning, and you're saying, save me, Most Holy Theotokos, save me, right? And she's on the boat uh, or the ark of the church if, you, if we want to, make this kind of, you know, analogy. So when we call out Most Holy Theodokos, save us, we are um, asking her to help to deliver us from something, from some kind of peril that we're in, um, not attributing the salvation of the Savior, you know, to her, but that she is drawing us to his salvation, right? 
if we're really truly pursuing Christ and not holding back, if we're really pursuing him and allowing everything in us to die and really fall in love with him and really be enveloped by him, we're going to be at some point struck with and initiated into a family that is his, right? Into his body. And so that stuff cannot be ignored, you know? Then we start to see, if we truly start to see Christ in everybody, then it can be ignored that there are holy people, right? That bear his image, that we pay a certain honor or respect to. And we do that even, we do that among the living people that we see around us. When we see people who are holy or we meet people that are holy or have this God-bearing quality, we give them a certain veneration, you know, um, because they inspire us, because we know that their prayers are heard by God, because we know that they have this great longing and love for Christ that kind of draw us with them, um, along with them. Um, and so the same thing is with, with the saints, you know. One might say that the saints are, are dead people, but we don't believe that God is a God of the dead, right? He's a God of the living. And so, especially these people who are particularly holy and devoted to God or gave themselves up for him um, in, a lot, in different manners of, of speaking, whether that's just to give up riches or actually to give their life for him and these kinds of things, um, that these people go on to live with him, right? And there's a distinction that people make of the church triumphant, which is the church in heaven, right? The saints in heaven, and then uh, the church militant, the, the church is still alive, the church that's living um, on earth. And both, but both of those, uh, if we, even if we want to describe it that way, both of those are united in the body of Christ. They're not separated from one another, you know? And so they're not dead, they're living. They're part of our body. They're those who surround us. When we enter into liturgy, we enter into prayer, we're entering into this heavenly space, this heavenly realm, because as we draw closer to Christ and give ourselves completely to him, we're immersed in this, uh, in paradise, in this heaven reali heavenly reality. And in that we see the, the great cloud of witnesses, right, that is talked about in the scriptures. And so we can't help but look to and emulate these friends that, that, we, that we come to know, right? These family members within the body of, of Christ that we have come to know through their various characteristics, how they have given themselves over to Christ, how they inspire us, how they uh, maybe even clearly um, display certain dogmatic characters in their writings and things like this, help us to live more ascetically, help us to give up this, help, help us to conquer the passion of lust, help us to conquer the passion of greed, or whatever it may be, you know, in our life. And so as we draw close to Christ, we are initiated into this larger family, you know. So it's not possible to be immersed in him, but yet at the same time not have any um, conception of the his body that surrounds us, right? And so it's not just about accepting dogmatics. It's not just about accepting something that has been practiced for, for ages and ages by Christians. It's, it's about an experience of God, and that experience of Him initiates us into this wider experience of, of heavenly paradise, which is filled with His holy people. Yeah, I think that it's very true because the church is not, it's not dead, you know. It's, like I said before, it's not an archaeological um, museum or something like this. Because the church is living, it gives birth to saints throughout all of the ages, even up until today, even those who are living right now. Um, and I think a quality that many people experience when they're around these holy people is this God-bearing quality of a peace that surrounds them, an otherworldly Christ-like peace, a wisdom that um, crowns them. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a wisdom of simplicity. It's a childlike spirit, but at the same time, 
it gives so much meaning um, to one's life. You know, there is people who I've met in in my life who are are very saintly people, and they're always very childlike. They've always they 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 have a freedom to them in that they've surrendered their whole self to Christ, and Christ lives and dwells within them. And to be around them is quite a humbling experience because many times we we have so much in our head, like we're so um, we're so complicated. We make ourselves so complicated, and when you run into these people who um, have a childlike simplicity and truly carry out the Lord's calling to become like a child, yet have so much wisdom and peace and discernment and all of these things, um, you can't help but uh, feel Christ's presence around them. Um, and yes, miraculous things do happen uh, within the lives of these people. Um, discernment um, happens where maybe maybe this person had never met someone before, this holy person, and yet they call them by their name and know their their background and things like this, or tell them maybe something that will happen in their life that comes true later, or reveal certain things maybe in their confession that they forgot about, but the holy person knows about, and these kinds of uh, divine, this kind of like divine perception, but also miracles and healings and prayer and things like this that um, surround these people. And these are all manifestations of, of Christ's love being worked out through these people, you know, in, in the Thanksgiving prayers for Holy Communion, we, we ask Christ to come and dwell in us, right? And even, it even says in, in the, in the um, Thanksgiving prayers, to control us, you know, control us, go into all of our members and control us, you know. Um, and, and, and in some ways we're asking Christ, despite my sins, despite all of my, uh, all of my passions and all of my habits and stuff, like put it, all, put it all aside and control me, make me a holy person, we almost ask him, like force me to become holy, you know. Um, and in the lives of these holy people, that's how they animate, you know. They, they're just animated by the love of Christ and, um, and this radiates around them. Um, to people who come in into contact with them.